we're definitely going to change gears uh, here from the last three talks. Um, Naomi uh, asked me to give a little bit of a historical perspective on uh, the, the use of models at NHC, kind of uh, where we are now in terms of the verification, uh, and uh, so that's what we'll do. Um, just uh, talk briefly about sort of the hierarchy of tropical cyclone track models that we've used uh, operationally at NHC. Um, <clears throat> starting with the statistical model, the simplest model is the clipper. Uh, climatology and persistence, this is, uh, simply tells you what uh, is normal in any given situation, doesn't know anything about what's going on in the atmosphere right now. Uh, the next step up uh, from that are these uh, NHC 72, 83, and 90, what we call statistical dynamical models, again, based on historical relationships, uh, but they also add current and um, forecast predictors from some parent model. Uh, in terms of the dynamical models, we have the two-dimensional models going back first with uh, uh, Sandbar and, and uh, uh, now some of the ones that we use now, LBAR and the, and the BAM models, which are simply trajectory models, taking a vortex and moving it along in, in a flow prescribed by a parent model. Uh, next step up are the three-dimensional models, either regional or global, a list of ones that are currently in use. Uh, and then uh, what we call the consensus models, and we'll talk a uh, little bit more about those uh, in a bit. So that's the hierarchy. Um, I want to talk about one other thing in terms of operational utility of these models, and that's the notion of early versus late models. And for those of you who aren't involved in the operational end of things, uh, this is really important in terms of whether a model can actually be used by a forecaster. Uh, if you imagine the 12Z forecast cycle uh, for the forecast that NHC has to issue at 15Z, uh, the 12Z GFS, for example, the 12Z runs of all these models, aren't going to come to the forecaster until after that 15Z forecast goes out. So he can't use those uh, uh, models, and they're known as late models. They're too late uh, for the forecaster to use. Um, some of the models are available in time. We call those the early models, things like LBAR and the BAMs, and of course the statistical models. But there's a process uh, that we call uh, interpolation for historical reasons, uh, where we take the latest available run uh, of the dynamical model. So for the 12Z forecast cycle, we go back to 6Z, or if it's a model run twice a day, we'd go back uh, to 0Z. Uh, and adjust these forecasts so that they apply for the forecast cycle that we're currently working with. Uh, the way that would work, uh, so again, imagine we're trying to do the 12Z forecast. We go back, we take the 6Z GFS, and maybe it had a track like this, and there's the six-hour forecast valid at 12Z, but the actual 12Z position of the storm's over here. So already it's off in the first six hours. So we simply lift this forecast up and move it so that the 6Z position agrees, the six hour forecast rather, agrees with the 12Z position. Everything shifts and the original 18 hour forecast from the 6Z run would be our 12 hour forecast adjusted for 12Z. So that's how we take the late models uh, and adjust them so that the forecaster can actually use them. Um, now looking at some trends here, uh, going back to 1970, uh, these are just average uh, NHC official forecast errors in time. You can see that in the 70s and 80s, there wasn't a great deal of improvement. Big, big improvement in the decade of the 90s. Not quite so much in the current decade, but still substantial. And we'll look at that in a little bit more detail here in terms of the models. This, was, uh, this is an update that I think Mark DiMaria put together originally, uh, just showing a non-homogeneous uh, verification of the forecast aids that were available uh, to the hurricane center. So you have to be careful because this is non-homogeneous. They're not run in any given year on the same set of forecasts. But to give you a little idea of what was going on, the statistical and statistical dynamical models here are the solid squares. You get into the two-dimensional uh, models here in the uh, solid triangles. Uh, first of the three-dimensional models here, QLM and MFM, and the solid circles are our modern era uh, dynamical forecast here. And you can see what was available 
uh, over time. A couple interesting things here. If you go back to the early 1970s, uh, the primary guidance, operational guidance, were these statistical dynamical models for TRAC. And they dominated operations through the 70s and through the 1980s. Uh, although you can see here some hints of the success that was to come in the three-dimensional dynamical models here. This is, the, this is the MFM. But it was available very, very rarely. And it came in too late to really be used. So although it looks like that was what was driving things, it really wasn't. It was still the statistical dynamical models that were the primary guidance for the forecaster until about 1990. Uh, in the early 1990s was when the aviation and the GFDL became available. But they were still awkward to use because they were late models. And it wasn't until 1994 that that interpolation process was put into effect that actually allowed the forecaster to make easy use of the previous cycle dynamical model. 1994. Um, in the 2000s, beginning in around 2000, was the first formal construction at NHC of the consensus models, the ensembles. Louis said that we don't have multi-model ensemble for Hurricane. We do. We've been using it through 2000. Uh, GFDL, UK Met, maybe no gaps. Uh, uh, these models are all put together, get the ensemble mean from that. We've been doing that for 10 years now. Um, so this has been shown before. Uh, again, actually, some of these lines do look pretty straight. But if you go into skill space, uh, where you take into account forecast difficulty, you do see some steps here. And this is skill now, going back to 1990, the NHC official forecast. And the, the two most noticeable upticks here occurred right around 2000. And again, here, 2008. And I attribute these uh, to two things. Number one, the increase here was when we first started formulating these multi-model consensus at NHC. It had been done uh, by the forecasters subjectively prior to that. But we actually started calculating these and displaying them uh, in the ATCF for the forecaster to, to see. Uh, and uh, I believe that's what this jump was associated with. And the increase here, 2008-2009, uh, corresponds to the greater availability, again, in, the, in our ATCF for the ECMWF model. So for the last two years, forecasters have had, have had access to that, and it's done very, very well. We've seen an increase in skill due to that. <clears throat> this is uh, similar to the diagram I showed before, but this is a homogeneous uh, sample, so you can actually uh, compare one model to another and get an idea of which one's doing better here. The dashed line is Clipper. Going back to 1994, the solid line is the NHC official forecast. So one thing to notice in this diagram that there's a pretty good spread, and that spread is growing, uh, between the skill baseline, or the, or the no skill level, and the official forecast. So the official forecasts have skill relative to this baseline. That skill is growing with time. Uh, and uh, you can see, I think here, starting uh, right around 2001, these consensus models, these two consensus models, the GUN-A, which is the average of the GFDL, the UK MET, the no gaps, and the aviation, or GFS, uh, and uh, another one that we use a lot, this uh, what we now call TVCN, uh, which includes a couple other models now, including the ECMWF. Uh, the Navy version of the GFDL also goes into that, and the FSU Super Ensemble. Uh, which is a corrected consensus model. Uh, the gun A is just a simple average. Take the four members, add them up, add the latitudes, divide by four. Add the longitudes, divide by four. Very complex stuff here. Um, whereas the FSU Super Ensemble uh, attempts to look at a training period and uh, correct for biases and weight the models in, in an in a, um, intelligent way, uh, you can see that the consensus models have been uh, the best uh, here uh, through the last decade. Uh, and since we've been doing that, it's very rare that any single model beats the NHC official forecast. And we're very, very close to the model consensus. Now, you can do ensembles from a single model. 
you can do, you can have an ensemble of completely different independent models, and we do both. We use both uh, at the Hurricane Center. Um, stealing some stuff from Jim here. Uh, but but uh, Jim did some nice stuff talking about how you can estimate the error, some of the characteristics of an ensemble. Uh, and it basically turns on the number of uh, models that you've got and the standard deviation of those errors, which in turn is related to the mean uh, error of those individual members. And the, but the key point here is that these models that we're throwing in there are not independent, particularly so if they're all from the same base model. And you can calculate what the uh, level of independence is from one of these uh, uh, one of these ensembles by looking at the relationship of the standard deviations. When you do that uh, in the Atlantic and the East Pacific, you, you, you find a couple of interesting things. Number one uh, is that if you take these four uh, models, the GFS, the GFDL, the UK Met, and the no gaps, these are the four members of the GUN-A consensus. Uh, this is the cumulative error distribution. You do get some improvement. Here's the GUN-A down here in the dashed purple line, but it's pretty close. Uh, to what you're getting from these other models. And if you compute the number of, indepe of, of uh, truly independent models, it's only worth one and two-thirds independent models in the Atlantic. In the East Pacific, you do the same thing, and that consensus actually buys you quite a bit. You get a much better performance here in the East Pacific. Uh, these four models actually are worth about two and a half uh, independent models. I think this is saying something about the kind of flows that you have in the two basins. Uh, you don't have a lot of independence in the Atlantic because basically uh, the forecasts are controlled by the very uh, synoptic situations that you have in the Atlantic, whereas in the East Pacific, it's a very simple flow. 285 and 11 is, is, is sort of our uh, uh, default forecast there because it's uh, basically the same synoptic situation all the time. And the random aspects or different aspects of the models allow you to get better cancellation of errors here. <coughs> so the key is to have independence. And for that reason, our multi-model ensembles, this is a skill diagram, so up is good here uh, in this diagram. Our best models are the multi-model ensembles. So here's the GUN A consensus, here's the FSU super ensemble. Notice, notice another point here, that the corrected consensus, the FSU super ensemble, over the last five years, a uh, little better than just the straight atom up and divide by four uh, out through 48 hours, but it's not as good as the simple atom up and divide by four approach at the longer times. We've never really been able to get uh, much out of the corrected consensus approach in the Atlantic. The other point here, here's the GFS ensemble mean. It's way down here. And it's not even as good as the control run until you get out to days four and five. So for tropical cyclones, at least, the single model uh, ensemble has not been very effective for us. All right, just a couple words about intensity. We've got uh, two or three minutes left here. Again, same hierarchy of models. Statistical models for intensity, decay shiffer, again, this is just what's normal. Um, doesn't know anything about what's going on in the atmosphere. We have two statistical dynamical models, decay ships and LGEM. Uh, and then we have our dynamical models. Global models don't have the resolution to help us any, uh, but we do have the regional models, which do. Um, same diagram I showed before, a couple points. Here's skill here, cl the clipper, uh, decay shiffer baseline, rather. Notice that there's much less skill in intensity forecasting. There are a lot of years where the official forecast doesn't have skill. Well, there are a few of them anyway. And there are a lot of years where many of the models don't have skill either. Right. Um, the other thing to point out is that in almost every year, it's a statistical model that gives us the best forecast, not the dynamical models. The dynamical models have not yet caught up to the statistical models for tropical cyclone intensity. You can see that here looking at the last three years. Here's the official forecast in black. Uh, here are the two dynamical models. Here's the GFDL in green. Here's the H wharf in pink. Um, not much skill here. Statistical model, the best one is LGEM. And here's our multi-model consensus icon. That's just those four. Add them up and divide by four. And we 
We do even better than the official forecast. So the multi-model consensus uh, is, is really helping us. Uh, and the point here is that the statistical models uh, really haven't been caught up to by the dynamical models yet. So I'm not optimistic that we're going to see much in the way of uh, any big increase in intensity skill uh, from the dynamical models over the next five years. They still have to catch up to things that don't know anything about what's going on in the core, really. I think that was my last slide. So thanks very much.